phone. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your body that is, is, is present right now. That's to bless you as you bless us with your word. God, we look forward to your promise of a blessing for studying this book of Revelation, the revelation of your son. And God, we pray right now that you would um, just give us a joy and a rejoicing in your, in your final outcome, God, and, and the, the plan you have for the ages. We just thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as stated, the book of Revelation, singular, is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus, the revealing of Jesus Christ. The curtain is being pulled away, and we see Jesus Christ revealed as the absolute king of the earth, the king that um, who has purchased the earth, paid for the earth, created the earth, and um, wrested control of the earth from Satan. He defeated Satan in the legal judicial sense on the cross and wiping out and paying for all individual personal sins of humanity. But we still have the, the sin of the world system, the sin of uh, evil, the sin of uh, corruption, the sin of Satan's final... Um, hold out against God as he resists Christ who's going to come and reclaim this planet as his own. And we have for the past few chapters here, Revelation 14 is kind of an outline of how things are going to wrap up. And 15, 16 had our different trumpets uh, com culminating on Babylon. Babylon is key. And then We've had, we now have two chapters where Babylon is defined and, and in great detail is drilled down into giving us more and more specific information about who Babylon is. And last time in Babylon, in um, <laughs> Revelation 17, um, we, we saw this massive global religious spirit, the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of, um, of the false religious system. And again, it's kind of like, after the rapture, you have all the unsaved Catholics, unsaved Baptists, unsaved Presbyterians, unsaved, you name it, um, all in panic and all in um, desperation to prove their point, um, create and allow a huge super religious system to, to develop. And we've come to realize that religion has always been the tool of the devil. Religion has always been Satan's creation. There's nothing divine about a religious attitude because religion, if we define it as uh, working towards acceptance by God, trying to be good, trying to improve yourself to appease God or make yourself more holy or more perfect, pick a religious system, none of that can possibly please God because all of us are fallen and we cannot save ourselves. So the religious system, as we recall in the last chapter, the beast, the, the powers of the world, Satan himself, came and destroyed the religious system. The religious system served Satan's purposes, and it has served Satan's purposes for the ages. For thousands of years, different religious systems have kept people from God, have prevented people from finding Christ. And Satan has used them to, to accomplish that. But in the end, when Satan is firmly cast down and he is locked into his final seven years, he is going to, at that three and a half year period, get sick and tired of people worshiping him through a proxy, through a different religion, through Buddha, through an idol. And he's going to demand, finally, what he's always wanted, personal worship. So the, Satan will get rid of the religious system and will destroy it. And we saw that the beast destroyed and devoured the woman and the usefulness of a false religious system comes to an end from Satan's perspective. And now in chapter 18, we have what looks like the same thing, the destruction of Babylon. But there's a lot of differences here, and we'll get to that. 
And um, the best way that most people have to contrast this is Babylon is one system. It is one completely evil, anti-God, demonic system. However, in chapter 17, it was the religious system. And in chapter 18, it's the political and economic system. And it, it drills down into more detail. But let's just go ahead and get started. Chapter 18, verse 1. So then after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. We have an angel. These are angels that have been speaking on God's behalf. They're angels that have been blowing the trumpets, pouring out the vials. And this angel here has the light and glory of heaven. And it, he carries it with him enough to light the earth. The earth is like, like there's a big flash of light as this angel comes around and he cries with a strong voice. It says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It's said twice there, fallen, fallen. And um, this indicates great speed. And this falling happens very swiftly. We had in the previous um, chapter, the, the fall of spiritual Babylon, happens after the beast has used it to his advantage. And once, as with everything else, once Satan is done using somebody, he dro dro drops them, he destroys them. If Satan can use a drug addict to cause a lot of problems, he'll use them. If the drug salesman, drug dealer, he might build them up, make them rich, but when he's done with him, he kicks them to the curb. There's a little aside here, but um, just remember that when you're getting ready to sin, a lot of times you might think Jesus is not your friend, but after you are kicked down and you have the consequences of sin you're dealing with, it, that is when Jesus does become your friend. Jesus is the one that is there to give grace even if it is your fault. And that's hard for us to handle sometimes. But remember, Satan's the one that is your friend when he wants you to sin. And then when you do, and the consequences, that's when he stops being your friend. So. A little contrast there, but we have <clears throat> Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. So in this case, it's falling quickly. And um, we'll probably see here that this aspect of Babylon, this commercial and political aspect is probably, or commercial and economic aspect is probably, happens later. We know that there's no use for a, a false religion when Satan is demanding that everyone worship him. But this seems to last longer. So the contrast of two religions, our, our two, two Babylons, our religious Babylon in chapter 17 is called Mystery Babylon. And she's symbolized by the great harlot, the whore of Babylon, if you will. And it's identified with with the, a spiritual system, many people think it may be identified with Rome. Um, you had the center of Babylon. If you recall in Zechariah 6, the woman wickedness was put into the ephah container and shipped back to Shinar, to Babylon, to be established there. And of course, this spoke of how Babylon, from the Jewish perspective, always referred to idolatry. And one thing that did cease when the Israelites were brought back um, from the Babylonian captivity was uh, idolatry did cease. That no longer was an issue with Israel. But um, when that woman, when the, when the symbol there, the wicked woman was sent back to Babylon to be established, that center of Babylon, you know, it's, it went to Pergamum. It's described in Revelation. Um, Rome was certainly the center of the fourth beast that um, the, uh, the disciples recognized. They expected persecution from Rome. They were promised it. I remember in Thessalonians, they were afraid that when persecution came from other places that maybe they'd miss the rapture. But um, getting back to that, this is the religious Babylon. Um, she's called a woman, a whore, a mother and guilty of those abominations and destroyed by the political powers. So destroyed by the beast. Uh, we're gonna see in this next chapter, this commercial Babylon is associated with, it's called Great Babylon, Babylon the Great, and it's associated with a great city. So 
as we go through this, we'll break this down. So verse two, fallen is fallen. It's become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So as this Babylon falls, is, is ultimately destroyed, we see here that it says that it's fallen and is the habitation of devils. Um, we, we saw a few chapters back that the final fall of Satan, and by that I mean cast out permanently onto the earth, no longer allowed to, you know, stand in heaven and accuse the brethren, completely cast down permanently, that in a sense, he's cast down to his prison, not his final prison, but it says habitation of de devils in the hold of foul spirits. This spiritual Babylon means that the demons, the demons of Satan, the demons that came out of the, the river, they all are being held, they're trapped. Um, as ugly as this is, it's kind of like God has all of them right where he wants them. They're being held and trapped, and that talks about a cage of every unclean, hateful bird. Unclean birds symbolize demons many times in the Old Testament. You may, be, may recall they symbolized demons when they stole the seed that the sower was sowing in the parable. Said, you know, unclean birds, demons come and steal the seed and don't allow people to, um, not allowed to grow into fertile soil. And so more information about this, this Babylon, verse three, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Of course, fornication in the religious sense always meant idolatry, but in this sense it's, sense, it's going to mean just corruption. It's going to mean that the political system, economic system is completely corrupt. And it says, and the kings and political leaders of the earth have fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through, rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So Babylon is responsible for making people rich, makes kings and presidents rich, presidents rich and makes merchants rich, but they, they're rich in, in corruption, rich in fornication. And um, we don't want to fall into the trap of you know, some Christian or some people, the world often likes to attack people because they're rich. God has nothing against wealth, nothing against riches. He's the one that allows people to become wealthy and he provides riches without sorrow. And the thing is that when we have these, um, these riches that come from corruption, I think for me, one of the best examples is in the Revolutionary War, one of the things they fought against was, it was called mercantilism. Mercantilism was when, when England created laws and the laws didn't benefit anybody except to create revenue for people that lived in London. And one of the best examples is that throughout the entire British empire, which covered the entire world at that point, the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire was something they bragged about. And they would pass laws in parliament that said anybody that shipped goods between countries in the world, all goods have to go through London first. So if I shipped, uh, you know, shipped some rugs from India and then went to Hong Kong, I had to go to London first. If you didn't do that, you're guilty of smuggling. And in the, in the States, what would happen is if I, uh, if I made a horse saddle in the state of North Carolina and I put it on a cart and shipped it down to someone and purchased it in South Carolina, I was now suddenly a smuggler. I was breaking the law of, the, of, of England. And mercantilism meant that laws were made to get, make people rich had nothing to do with providing a service. And today we call it crony capitalism. So the idea that I can just control the government, control laws, control um, people's lives, and I don't have to really do anything for it. I don't have to, don't have to provide a service, don't have to provide um, um, you know, a product or anything. 
this is the corruption that ultimately reaches a head here in, in Babylon. So we have, like the spiritual system was doing its fornication. And we have in verse three here, the earth, the merchants of the earth became rich by wealth and economic power of her, it says delicacies, sensuous luxuries. So I like luxury as much as the next person, but these are just ill-gotten gains. These are people who get rich by the world system. And it is the world system that is being judged here. And so verse four is interesting. We have just established some of the evils of this um, economic or commercial Babylon. But verse four, and it says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you may be not partakers of her sin and that you receive none of her plagues. So we still have, now this is a good verse for all of us. We wanna make sure that we're not part of the Babylonian system when we're doing our business. We um, have to be very sensitive. And what, what constitutes the Babylonian system? Well, cheating, lying, um, manipulation, success on the hurt of others. And that's something to be conscious of. If I'm, if I'm doing stock markets or, or other things, are my, are my wins because someone else lost, okay? There's ways to avoid that. And, you know, in an, an honest system, it can be done very legitimately. But um, our, our um, come out of her. We have Isaiah 52 says, come out of there. Do not touch any unclean thing. Be clean. Uh, Jeremiah 50, flee from the midst of Babylon. Everyone save their life. Jeremiah 51, go out of the midst of her. Um, Second Corinthians, do not be unequally yoked with believers. We usually apply that to marriage, but I think we should, could also legitimately apply that to business partners. Coming out of Babylon, have no food, fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them in Ephesians. So economic, political systems. Uh, a lot of us, especially in America, are very politically sensitive and very hyper in a lot of ways about politics. And I got two things I want to say, and half of you are going to be mad at the first one, but that's because the other half will be mad at the second one. So if we think about it, we have one political ideology in America that says, <clears throat> when things go bad, you should go trust the state, trust the government. And this is taking away from the sovereignty of God. Now, can God use the government? Absolutely. Just like he can use doctors and lawyers and all the other things. But an ideology that says that my source is the state, my source is the world system, my comfort is the world system. If something goes bad, the first thing I do is I want to sue somebody. If anything goes wrong, the first thing I do is run to, to, to the state, to the world system. That's idolatry. And that is an attitude of the Babylonian system. Um, one of the goals of socialism is to seduce people into breaking the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. And we have a culture today that says hating the rich or wanting what someone else has is perfectly acceptable. And so that's one aspect of probably a predominant ideology in America. Now, another predominant ideology in America is a self-made man. Raise you up by your own bootstraps. Rely on nobody but yourself. And we raise children to be independent. We want to wean them of their dependency. And that's a good thing. But we often err because we want everybody, as they wean themselves off of dependency, to transfer that dependency to God. So you could be a person that goes up into the other ideology that says, I don't need anybody. I can pull my own weight. I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps and I don't need help from anybody and I can't, I don't need no charity. And that is worship of self. That is another trap we have in the American political realm of sitting there and going, oh, I don't need anybody. And 
and looking down with disdain at somebody that does need somebody. So it's very easy to be in one ideology and be self-righteous and think you're better than those that are in the other ideology. Now, obviously, all of these things can be mollified by understanding who God is. God uses all of these things. Um, we ask for God's protection and God's prayer and, and, and God's sovereignty in all these matters. But I just think we need to be sensitive that no matter what happens, we can all be prone to leaning towards Babylon a little bit, saying, oh, well, I can just cheat this one time. Um, we have a very good example when the Pharisees asked Peter, does your master pay taxes? And Peter says, oh, of course we do. And then he ran to Jesus and said, did we pay our taxes? And Jesus says, it doesn't make any sense for the conquered people to be paying, for people who are not conquered to pay taxes. Sons of the kings don't pay taxes. Only conquered people pay taxes. He was acknowledging the evil of a Babylonian concept of uh, people having their livelihood taken from them, as Rome did. Um, you know, usury taxes, things like that. But in the next breath, he said, however, to avoid causing offense, go catch some fish and you'll find the money and better pay both our taxes. As Christians, we're not called to be revolutionaries. I'm not called to overthrow the system or called to keep the peace. But when we realize that the world has shafted us, hey, the world just stole my money. God is able to more than make up for it. So we have a submission there, realizing that God is on the throne and we put God first. God is sovereign and he supersedes all these other ideologies. <clears throat> so that being said, this is verse four, come out of for my people. God is calling out to the people of this time. <clears throat> we have a voice from heaven saying, there's still a chance. Separate yourself from this wicked system. <clears throat> and we, we find in verse 5 a description, more details of the wicked system of this commercial Babylon. <clears throat> this verse 5, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. It says, God has remembered her iniquities. God's aware of all of her crimes and has reached a tipping point. <clears throat> God is a God of patience, but God has declared that at some point his patience will come to an end. And it comes to an end based on um, well, God's patience exists so that more people can get saved. The reason that God doesn't wipe everything out right now is because there's still a chance that people can get saved. And we have these horrible crimes for her wickedness. <clears throat> and so verse 6, reward her even as she rewarded you. So this is God's, the crimes that Babylon has done, the primary crimes have been to the saints. If you recall in the previous one, the blood of the saints. Those are the ones that God regards as worse. <clears throat> crimes against the saints. And it says, reward her as she rewarded you. Double her according to her works. Um, and uh, in the cup which she has filled, filled her double. This is talking about double punishment. We see double punishment on occasion in the Old Testament. Double punishment is also um, back to vengeance. Remember, justice is eye for an eye. Vengeance is... Punitive. Vengeance is the when the punishment is much, much bigger than the crime. And that's totally justified. In courts today, punitive is when someone knew they're doing a crime, they knew it was hurting people, and they didn't care. They didn't try to mitigate it. In this case here, it's punitive because vengeance is on Babylon as the as Satan's world system. Again, a world system that has two parts, the religious and the commercial. And what did she do that was so bad? Verse 7. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow given her. Give her. So as much as she has glorified herself, punish her. As much as she has lived deliciously, punish her. And again, living deliciously, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. But in this case, you're living off of the 
fruits of another labor. You're living off the plight of others. You're living off cheating them. You're living off oppressing them. You're living off enslaving them. And whenever someone is made rich at the expense of others, that is the Babylonian economic system. So we have an interesting thing here is that she needs to be punished. She's uh, a, a guilty of three things, living luxuriously, glorifies herself, pride, and then she says, I am no widow, will see no sorrow. So the third thing that she's kind of guilty of is not having sorrow. And by that, we means completely unrepentant, has absolutely no sense of having done anything wrong. But I want to focus on this weird phrase that says, I'm a queen and am no widow. This is the bragging of the Babylonian system. I'm a queen. I'm in charge. I will suffer no hurt. Nothing can hurt me. And by the way, I'm not a widow. Try to think about why this queen, this system is saying this. And this is a mocking. The number one thing is that it is mocking, it is mocking the other woman that we mentioned earlier. Remember the other woman, the one clothed at the sun. These two women are in contrast. We have the woman clothed with the sun in Israel. And this woman here is mocking here, saying, huh, I'm not a widow. Well, what's a widow? A woman whose husband has passed away, a woman with no husband. She's looking at Israel and saying, I'm no widow. Your God is dead. Your husband has abandoned you. Your husband's gone. This is a, a blatant mockery of Israel. And this woman is saying, oh, you thought you were married to Yahweh. Well, he's gone. He left you. And this kind of ties into a lot of replacement theology where you have the idea that God has left Israel. And this would be a typical thing for Satan to do, to mock Israel and say, God's left you. You have no place. You have no standing. You have no future. And so much of the prophecies talk about the future of Israel. So it's, it would be kind of like, um, you, know, you know, people, uh, I'll go about, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say something about that later. The other thing to talk about is they're mocking the church. The church is gone at this point. The church, people are, are being slaughtered. You accept, you refuse to accept the beast or his mark, you're killed. The 45,000 are supernaturally preserved. But Satan would love to look at us and say, you have no husband. Oh, you think you're the bride of Christ. Well, he's not coming back. You're on your own. And so this is a deliberate dig. And this is what Babylon is saying, trying to tell anybody who has hope in God that they have no hope in God. So I like that phrase. I'm a queen. I'm not a widow. This is just, and in fact, um, the queen here, you know, has a relationship with the devil. And the devil, in fact, is going to destroy her when he's done with her deed, done with using her. He's, and I'm not going to see any sorrow. So she's bragging in this verse, saying, I'm, I'm, I'm luxury, I'm pride, I'm glorified myself, I'm a queen, and... And my husband's not dead like the rest of you. And I'm not going to see any sorrow. I am immune to punishment. I'm immune to uh, criticism. I am not accountable to anybody. This is the top economic global system of the time. So, verse 8. For this reason... Shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judged her. So, we always are asking the question, is this literal? Is this spiritual? And I think it's pretty well established that in the previous chapter, that the mystery Babylon is, was a metaphor for, you know, a, a global satanic one world one world religious system made up of a lot of different things but um here how symbolic is babylon in this chapter 
And you could say it symbolized, like we said, commercial uh, evil, uh, political and economic um, perversion. But I need to, we talked about last week that Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 are sister chapters to these chapters 17 and 18. And so I want to turn Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, just right there in the middle. Isaiah 13 and 14 talk about the judgment of Babylon. And it's very clear this is the city of Babylon, the one on the river Euphrates. There's no, there's no symbolism here. It's talking about um, the Babylon that hurt Israel, and the Babylon that was used by God to punish Israel. So, um, but I'm going to just pick a couple sections here. Isaiah 13, verse 14. 13, I'm sorry, no, verse um, 19. Isaiah 13, verse 19. This is talking about Babylon being cut down. Uh, no pity on the womb. Verse 19, in Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans pride will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. And Babylon, it will never be inhabited or lived in again from generation to generation. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will let the sheep lie down there. Desert creatures will lie there with owls, which are unclean animals, ostriches and wild goats, hyenas, jackals, Babylon. So this is predicting a future of Babylon written by Isaiah that is declaring Babylon will be utterly destroyed and will never again be inhabited. And all I can say is that has never happened yet. It was conquered by the Persians and made the capital. It fell into disarray and it's, it has, it's, you know, people have lived there. They live in the ruins now. Um, Saddam Hussein was trying to rebuild it, interestingly enough. But um, <clears throat> the question remains, what is Babylon in Revelation 18? Is it a city, a group of cities? Is it a system? And all I can say is Babylon has yet to be destroyed in the manner described in Isaiah 13. Jump over to Isaiah 14. And I'm just going to read this. Isaiah 14, verse 4. It says, that's what take up this proverb or taunt against the Babylon. Now recall in the prophecy against the prince of Tyre. The prince of Tyre was obviously given to the king. And then later on, the prophecy was a, a prophecy against the king of Tyre, which obviously was to Lucifer. And you start realizing that a lot of times when the Bible uses the word prince and then king, the word prince really means the king because the word king often means the demonic power behind the king, the source. So, so just check this out. Verse 4. Take up this taunt. How, how, hath, he, how hath your the oppressor ceased? The golden city has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the ruler. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Now the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They will break forth in singing. The fir trees will rejoice. The cedars of Lebanon will sing. Since thou art laid down. No one has come against us. So uh, this is saying that when the king of Babylon is ultimately destroyed and brought down, the earth will be finally be at peace. Well, I don't think the earth has been at peace since the kings of Babylon were destroyed by the Persians. This is something much, much bigger. The earth is going to be at peace. And then it says, verse 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet you. Now, if this is talking about the king of Babylon, it doesn't really make much sense. But if this is talking about the ultimate power behind Babylon, in other words, Satan himself, this says, hell is moved for thee to meet you at the coming. This is picturing when Satan himself is thrown into hell. And hell is, is, is expanded, rises up to meet him, says, yes, I recognize you, you belong here. Now, yes, it's a little picturesque, a little bit of personalization, because this is applying attributes to hell. 
but it's a great picture that it stirs up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from the thrones all the kings of the nation, and they will speak and say unto you, Are you also become weak as we? So, now we're not saying what life is like in hell, but this is a picture of all the evil dictators, all the throughout the history, all the kings that have gone to hell. They're going to look up and see Satan being thrown down into hell with them. And they say, you become weak like us. You're just like us. But your punk, your extravagance, your incredible power, the ones that we thought you, th you thought you made us great. You're nothing too. You brought down to the grave. The worms are spread over you. Worms cover you. How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? We see a wrap up here. This is Satan's final demise, which is something that we should be rejoicing in. So um, we also know that, you know, there's other verses that talk about um, Satan being regarded as a dog when he's going into hell. So let's go back to Revelation. In a single day, her plagues will come, verse 8. Uh, verse 8. A single day, plagues will come, be utterly burned with fire, and for strong as Lord God to judge you. So somehow this city will decide what this city is in a little bit, but the city is destroyed in a day, in an hour, it turns out. Something wipes out this city completely. And it says, verse 9, and the kings and political leaders of the earth who committed immorality and lived luxuriously with her will weep and beat their chest in mourning over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand a long way off in fear of her torment, saying, Whoa, the great city, the strong city Babylon, in a single hour your judgment has come. So who is weeping at the collapse of commercial Babylon? Kings and political leaders, all the people that were made rich, all the ones that were made wealthy from the the um, crony capitalism made wealthy from deceit and dishonesty. And it said they stand afar off. This means they're looking a long ways away. They're afraid to get close. They're seeing it on the satellites. They're seeing it on the TVs. And they're looking at this city. And my point is, it looks more and more like it's an actual city. Now, this city apparently is central to world economy. And you can start thinking of cities that might match that now. New York, uh, London, um, Stockholm, Venice, uh, Hong Kong. You know, you can start picking cities that, that make sense. It'd be interesting though, if we pick a city that doesn't make sense, but we find out later that it, it could. Um, and that's one way that Bible prophecy can surprise us sometimes. A lot of times people have made allegorical suppositions about a prophecy only to find out that oh it turns out it was literal after all um so these leaders the leaders will stand a long way off now i think it's a little upsetting that the political leaders are mad that the economic system has gone down because they shouldn't have been making money off of it anyway but it says they weep and they cry the city and one day is, is gone. Then it says, verse 11, the merchants, of, the merchants of the earth will weep and grieve her because no one buys their cargo, their goods anymore. So we have one category, political leaders. Second category, merchants. And this is their cargoes. And we have a list. And I think this list is very appropriate. There's no reason this list can't be very literal because this is what people buy and sell. Gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, linens, purple, scarlet. Silk, all kinds of scented wood, ivory, articles very costly, lavish wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spiced incense, perfume, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine oil, wheat, cattle, horses, chariots, slaves, and the souls of men, and Mercedes and smartphones, all the things that keep the world turning. And I do think, I, I didn't mean to gloss over the phrase slaves and souls of men. Slavery was a 50,000 person a day business in ancient Rome. Of course, slavery no longer exists, right? Wrong. 
Slavery is very active. You have slavery going across the borders of Mexico and America. You have slavery all throughout the Middle East. You have slavery in, it's everywhere. And it says, this is a business that sells that. And it also says, and the souls of men. How do you buy and sell the souls of men? Well, you give them false teaching. You tell them that you pay me money and um, you'll be saved. That's one way to deal in the souls of men. Another way would be to give false hope. Um, another way to, would be to destroy people's hope. Nothing more wicked than telling a person who is saved that they could lose it. Trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. Or telling a person that they are not allowed to be assured of their salvation. That is one of the tenets that was upheld by Vatican II, is that assurance of salvation is anathema. It is against the Catholic Church to declare that you can be assured of your salvation, which is kind of strange because that's what John said. I tell you these things so you can be assured of your salvation. Um, so again, and we have, continue on with our list of goods. Verse 17, ripe fruits, delicacies, for your soul desire have gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and extravagant are lost to you, never again to be found, and Verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her stand afar off for the fear of a torment, weeping and wailing. They stand away, long ways away. They're actually afraid that what happened there might happen to them too. So is this a single city? Is this a system? All we know, this is sounding very, very literal. And they say, alas, the great city. Um which was clothed in fine linen and purple, scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones for in one hour so great riches, riches has come to naught. I'm gonna stop there because we do need to pop back to Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, go back, find Isaiah, take a right. And we're looking at Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51. Verse 5. It's a long chapter. <clears throat> Verse 5. So recall that Babylon was bragging about not being a widow, implying that Israel was. Verse 5. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, says the Lord of hosts though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One. So Israel should have not been abandoned, but the land was full of sin and is full of sin before the Holy One of Israel. This is the land that Christ is going to come down to and reign upon, a land that not yet saved, not is full of sin. Verse 6, flee out of Babylon. Let every one of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment. So this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He is going to pay her what she has earned. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, intoxicating all the earth. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, the nations have gone mad. Babylon has suddenly fallen and is shattered. Wait for her if you dare. Get balm for her. Perhaps she may be healed. This is a hyperbolic rhetoric. Because no, we would have healed her, but she would not be healed. Abandon her and let each return to her own country. Her guilt judgment have reached the heaven and are lifted up to the very skies. The Lord has brought about our vindication and has revealed the righteousness of our cause. This is exactly the same situation. We just finished reading this. This is God will be vindicated and he will, he will reveal the righteousness of Israel. Is Israel righteous? No. Is Israel still full of sin? Yes. God's going to reveal the righteousness. And this is applicable to us. God saved us. He pronounced us righteous. He pronounced us perfect. He pronounced us blameless. Are we still? No, we don't act like it at all. We're far from it. But there will come a time when Jesus Christ is going to bring us to heaven and, and display our righteousness for everybody else. And this is how God gets glory. 
He looks at people like you and me. We accept him. He saves us and he brings us to heaven and he declares us righteous and then makes us righteous. He's declared Israel righteous. He will make Israel righteous. So this, again, this is the message of grace. This is the message throughout the entire Bible. This is God's goal for humanity is anybody who's willing and available to God, God will make righteous. The worst sinner when made righteous simply shows how great God is. God gets the glory, not the sinner that cleaned himself up. God gets the glory and is able to show us off as trophies of righteousness. So, yeah, that section in Jeremiah is just, hopefully it hits you real hard because it's the same thing we just finished reading in Revelation. Um, it's another reason why Revelation reads like an Old Testament book because it presents the 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 prophecies it presents the um declarations of damnation it presents uh the punishments in exactly the same way short term long term big picture drill down smaller picture and so so far when babylon collapsed we had the kings and rulers wept and they they were horrified we had the merchants weeping and anguishing and horrified because their source of riches is now gone and then verse 17 in the middle and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning say what city is like this great city and they cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing alas that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her her wealth costliness for in power she is made desolate. So three categories of people are in anguish because Babylon, the commercial system is destroyed. Remember, who destroyed it? Well, yes, God did it because he judged it, but how did God do it? In the previous chapter, it said that the beast devoured her and destroyed her. Satan destroys. God uses Satan to bring about destruction. God used Babylon to punish Israel, and then he punished Babylon for messing with his children. You know, no one messes with my kids. Only I get to do that. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> but we see here, we had the rulers that were made rich, the merchants, and the distribution system. This is the, the sailors. These are the, the FedExes and UPSs and the big companies that do global shipping, global shipping, overnight freight. These three groups are completely in anguish. They're distraught by all of this. So this all leads up to verse 20. Verse 20 is an amazing verse. This is the first time in the book of Revelation where the reader is given a commandment to rejoice. Rejoice over her, heaven. This is a command for those of us in heaven. I ask you a question. Are you in heaven? Yes. You've been seated in heavenly places. Are you in heaven? Yes. Because you are not a dweller of the earth. Remember that phrase in Revelation, dweller of the earth means one whose allegiance is the earth. You have been bought with a price. You're now saved. You are ransomed, redeemed. You are part of the body of Christ. You are part of seated in heavenly places. And when the Bible tells heaven to rejoice, that includes you. So we're supposed to rejoice. But after everything I just read, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? According to this, it should be rejoicing. And why is that? Because we should be so excited. We should be jumping up and down, rejoicing. Praise the Lord. He has finally put an end to Babylon. A long time to move. <laughs> if we have any sense of agreeing with God at all, we will be just ecstatic, rejoice. And it says specifically, you holy apostles and prophets. Now, neither one of us are apostles or prophets. In the New Testament, people that are called to prophesy means to profess like preachers. People that give witnessing to the gospel, that's a prophet. But in this case, in, in, in this context here, 
the apostles and prophets are specifically the ones to whom were given the, the, the right or the privilege to establish scripture, to canonize the scripture. What constitutes the scripture? What made, our, what made the, the books get into our Old Testament? What caused some to be in and some not to be in? The New Testament. What established whether a book is in the New Testament or not? And the answer is, in the Old Testament, a book had to be either written by or endorsed by a prophet. And the Bible established that Moses is a prophet. There's things that he prophesied. And of course, he authored his books. The New Testament, New Testament canon was established by apostles. Apostolic authority, apostolic miracles, apostolic accuracy, all these things. Every book in the New Testament was established you know, by the church, but it had to be either written by or endorsed by an apostle. And so you can definitely look at this and say, all of you apostles and prophets, all of you that were part of establishing scripture, all of you people that wrote about these different prophecies, you're getting a chance to see them come true. You're getting a chance to see God's faithfulness. And everybody who has learned to study the word and to trust the word should be really excited when the word comes true. So this again, is a, it's a future thing for us, but we should be able to rejoice in the future just like we rejoice in the present. I rejoice in my present salvation. I rejoice in my future salvation. So this is a nice little palate cleanser for us in the chapter. Rejoice over her, for God has avenged you on her. God has taken us vengeance. Everything that Babylon has done to the saints has now been paid back doubly, if not more so. Overkill, vengeance. This is like, you know, if you kill somebody, the justice is that person dies. Vengeance is kill him, bring him back to life, kill him again, bring him back to life, kill him again. That's not what this is saying here, but this is how excessive vengeance is. And when God is doing it, when he has the right to do it, we should be rejoicing. This is not the time to feel sorry for the world. Okay. We love the people in the world, and in this church age, our compassion is 100% towards every single person that Jesus Christ died for. But at this stage, that's over. If you recall, just before these judgments, it says, the glory of God filled the temple and nobody could enter. There is no place during this period in which anybody can enter the temple and plead for mercy. That era is over during during this period once this is over the people can go back but if you remember that verse it said no one could enter the temple until all the wrath was poured out so rejoice over her verse 21 and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea saying thus with violence shall that great city of babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all so now babylon who's next to water the sea in the Bible often refers to the Mediterranean. Um, who knows what type of asteroid is going to hit the Earth at this point? We've already had a lot of amazing astronomical things happen. But um, <clears throat> it talks about the, the consequences of this. And so I'm going to, um, my opinion is that this Babylon here is the actual rebuilt city of Babylon. I say that because. 50 years ago, had someone said that, it would have seemed like nonsense. Not quite so nonsense now. You could imagine a Babylon that emerges out of Islam or emerges out of the Middle East that finds itself allied, allied with the European Union. We also have no real way of trying to fit the Ezekiel 38 war into the future. It does not have to happen after the rapture. It could happen before the rapture. There's not really enough time in the tribulation to wrap things up. It could kick off the tribulation in some ways, how it fits. The biggest issue is that at the end of that war, it takes six months to, to clean up the dead. Well, there's no six-month window available at the end of the tribulation for that. 
and the, the end of the millennial reign, that war is won by a new heaven and a new earth. So there's a lot of mysteries how where that war is going to fit in. But we do know that that could lead to a big alliance that raises Babylon into a major, major commercial center. Um, it wouldn't take much. Uh, now, of course, as a commercial entity, you can pick all sorts of other cities that I mentioned earlier. And it could be a combination. Could be Babylon as a center, European Union as a distribution system, which is what it exists as today, right? It's basically a currency, a commodities market. So a lot of things could take place, but so many things in the Bible have turned out to be a whole lot more literal than people thought they were gonna be. Um, an example is that um, one of the crimes of Babylon of is sorcery. And you sit there and, you know, we, we, we live in an enlightened age where everybody talks about reason and science. And who could imagine that sometime in the future that sorcery is a major thing? But there's two things to think about there. Number one, sorcery is on the rise. All sorts of demonic um, movies, TV shows. People are being conditioned to think in those terms. I'm not going to be as rational as people want it to be. But secondly, when you see the word sorcery in the Bible, the, word, the Greek word is pharmakia, which would cause all of us to, to trigger in our brains, realizing that sorcery and drugs are hand in hand. Sorcery. Imagine some of the crimes of the Babylonian commercial system are dealing in medicine, legal narcotics, um, all, all sorts of over-the-counter things that destroy lives. And there's places for some of those things, but pharmacia, uh, regular drugs, pot, marijuana, rec rec recreational drugs. Those are all tied in with sorcery because as they damage the mind, they damage the mind's defenses and allow satanic activity to enter in. So all the more reason to rejoice when we see that system destroyed. And all the more reason to rejoice when we realize that we have already been rescued from that system. We've been called out, we've been rescued, we've been raised up. And as Christians, um, we don't participate in that system. We acknowledge that it exists, that we've been called out of the world, we're in the world, but not of the world. So to wrap up our chapter here, it says at the end of verse 21, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. It's gone. And I think a meteorite might do that. It could render it uninhabitable. And there are some portions that talk about certain cities where the smoke goes up forever. And I would like to envision that in the millennial reign, a, a reign of prosperity, a reign of wealth, a reign of great advances, a reign of perfect peace, you're gonna have a couple of smoking holes in the earth that are gonna be going up as remembrance. You're gonna have Damascus, the smoking hole. You're gonna have Babylon. You're gonna have a couple of places where the smoke is going to be there as a reminder. So what's going to be the result? Nothing else found there, verse 22. The voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in me. No more parties, no more music. No, no, no craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. No factories, no more music, no more crafting, any, any type of commerce is gone. This is the absolute end, permanent end to Babylon. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. This is going to be a dark place. No activity at all. It talks about a desert. Remember back in, in um, Isaiah talked about there might be a few owls and jackals, animals that can live in the dark. It says, the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Do you recall one of the things that happened before Noah's flood, before that punishment? Uh, I said, well, in those days, people were giving and taking in marriage, eat, drink, and be merry. Life was going on. And said, but calamity came upon them. Punishment came. And God's judgment is real. And it came then. And it will come here again. 
and it says uh, the rest of verse 23 for your merchants were the great men of the earth for by your sorceries were all men deceived there's that word sorceries by your drugs by your deceit by your chemicals by your uh, internet deceptions by your manipulation of the media all of this is deceived because the babylonian system is alive and well today and it's going to continue growing and um if you're upset with how things are happening recognize it for what it is we got no promise that things are going to get better when it comes to this system we have promises as christians that god will take care of us no matter what we have promises that you know the righteous will not be begging for bread but let's get used to finding those coins in the mouths of fishes and less used to having our money and our resources be what we're used to, okay? We don't know what the future holds. Um, I would love to think 2021 is going to be a whole lot better. We're not promised. All we know is that, as I said earlier, 2020, this is the year the Lord has made. 2021, when it happens, that will be the year that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And our rejoicing and our gladness is without um, repentance. And um, it, it's, it makes no sense. When the world sees us rejoicing, they, doesn't, they can't figure it out. Some of them are intrigued and some of them hate us for it. But the joy of the Lord goes beyond understanding. And the final verse for this chapter is the final, the ultimate crime of Babylon. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain on the earth. What's the, what's the ultimate crime of Babylon? Killing saints. Ultimate crime of Babylon was betraying saints, destroying saints, attacking saints. And remember saints in this case means Old Testament, New Testament, church, tribulation saints and this is what the crime of babylon through the ages has always been destruction of the saints destruction uh, attempted destruction of the messiah destruction and attempted attempts to foil the plan of god and what are we, we rejoicing in we're rejoicing that god is sovereign we're rejoicing that nothing that babylon did succeeded God saved, God, the Messiah came, he lived, he paid for our sins, he rose again, all of which Babylon tried to prevent, Satan tried to prevent every step of the way, tried to kill him before he was two years old, tried to kill him throughout his life. The one chance Satan was allowed to kill him is when God stepped back and said, this is your hour, Satan, you can do whatever you want. And in Satan's insane, rabid hatred, he jumped at the chance like a snarling dog and took out Jesus, only to realize he took him out exactly the right time, in the right place, with the right surrounding and the right people to pay for all of our sins. So the ultimate sting operation, using Satan's hatred and anger and insanity against himself. And he spent the rest of that time trying to assert himself as a false, illegitimate leader, trying to destroy what God has done, trying to destroy Israel and the Jewish people to prevent God from keeping his promises. And all we can say is that he's insane. He cannot accomplish that. So I think we're done with all the heavy stuff in Revelation. That wraps up the complete destruction of Babylon. And I'm just going to leave it with this. Let's rejoice. I know it's not the type of stuff we normally rejoice about, but in this case, we're called to rejoice. And let's rejoice. Let's praise the Lord. Rejoice with absolute thanksgiving that this will be done and it will be done at the right time to maximize souls in heaven and to purge the planet once and for all of the Babylonian system. In the millennial reign, we'll put it this way. Today, we deal with three things that drag us down. Our old sin nature, the world system, and Satan and his demons. In the millennial reign, we're getting rid of two of those things. Millennial reign, the, the descendants of the survivors of the tribulation 
will have only one thing to deal with, and that is their old sin nature. And that will be dealt with too at the end, a thousand years later. But in the meantime, let's rejoice. We're told to encourage ourselves with these things. So this is part of the blessing of be reading the book of Revelation. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, once again, we thank you for sharing with us your thoughts, your heart. God, you have called us friends, which is why you share things with us. And we don't just have to, um, you know, listen to you like like boss or like a general, God. But you have called us friends and you've given us your thoughts. Let us see the big picture. And we know that you have everything under control and you have written these prophecies so that when they come true or when today, as we see them starting to come true, we start seeing these beginning stirrings. We realize that everything's on schedule. Everything is going according to plan and you are still on the throne. So once again, God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you bless everybody here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. Thank you, Janice. I, I love you, Janice. I really appreciate that. I love you, too. I love you, too. God bless you. I'll see you next week. Uh, awesome. All Take right. Care. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, night. Good night hon. Good night, Janice. Good, good night. Okay. We'll see you, Dunish. Take care. It is a strange time. It really speaks in a lot of ways of what's going on in the world today, doesn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have this understanding, we'd be as terrified as the rest of the world. And I, and I, re I refuse to fear. I refuse to Absolutely. have fear. It doesn't make no. any difference. Uh -huh. Perfect love casts out fear. If you have uh -huh. a God that's omnipotent and all loving, that takes care of both. Think about it. If he was all powerful, but not all loving, I'd be, I'd be nervous. Mm -hmm. And if you were all loving but not all powerful, I wouldn't be too comforted. But that covers everything, and it's very hard for us to do that. But the more we put God first, the less we rely on these other things. And it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say it's not a little bit scary, but we can't, we can't focus on it. You know, which is, you know, God is the God of our salvation, and We've already been guaranteed everything we need. Well, he's either in control or he's not. Yeah, absolutely. And so, well, based on everything I've seen so far, and you look at all the prophecies that have come true, I think he's pretty, pretty in control. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's a little hard to fight someone that knows the future and can work all things together for good. It's the opposite of what you told me last week. Okay. So, so John, hear you you, uh, hey, no, they can't hear you right now. Yes, they can. Yeah, 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 they hear you. But your picture's not. Okay. Just now. Smell pretty, mom. <laughs> yeah, I'm having problems with the mute here. Bob's telling me just the opposite of what they did a week ago, so I'm having a little trouble. But, uh, John, yes. can you hear me? Yes, we can. I really appreciate that exp uh, explanation of Babylon because I've read that so many times and I never could figure out why Babylon has fallen. And then here's another whole chapter about mm -hmm. Babylon has fallen. And I never could figure out why it was repeated again I, to me. So I really appreciate the distinction that you, where you kind of made it oh, last Yeah, week, good. Yeah. Uh, going into it. I do have a question though. There's something I missed tonight and that was how did israel get in you were you brought that little bit about israel not being um uh, forgotten but i don't see it what verses in this chapter no they end? weren't um, they weren't in this chapter that was from the, the jeremiah section yeah you brought it in jeremiah but it was connected with revelation what in revelation about that? this chapter here does not talk about israel at all in the further chapters do and previous chapters have i was kind of applying it to the big picture so no israel was not mentioned specifically in in revelation 18. okay i kept I was talking trying to around find the verses and i couldn't no i was talking around it my apologies okay because you mentioned earlier about the war horn and so on it, it made sense but i couldn't find the verses so yeah thank you i was also contrasting the the woman clothed with the sun 
Israel. And um, yeah. And so these two women are, are representative of, of God and evil in a lot of ways. Uh, you started to say something, Stuart? I was going to say, I don't know if you saw the political thing that happened over the weekend, but Turkey and Israel signed a peace accord. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which isn't good news. <laughs> a little strange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks they can do it without God, so. We'll Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> It's bad enough thinking that you can be good without God because you're ignoring God. But what's really worse is how offensive it is to tell God, I can do it without God. That's just that that's really blasphemous because you were designed to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So if you can do the right thing the wrong way, <laughs> really telling God that he's useless. It's a lot worse than people think it is. It's really, um, it's, it's, it's very blasphemous. Mm. Wow, that's scary. It, 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 it should be, it should be scary. I always like pointing out the American Atheist Society, the motto is good without God. Mm. Hey, I don't care how good you are, if you're doing the right thing the wrong way. <coughs> I mean, I deal with kids in school. You know, it's like, you're supposed to be doing this right now. What are you doing instead? Oh, I'm updating my 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 planner the way I'm supposed to. You know, he said mm -hmm. you're doing the right thing at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't get away with disobeying because you're doing a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Students especially try that. Oh well, we all do. Yeah, it's like, oh God, I was doing the right thing. Yeah, look, I was I was I was doing a. Homeless outreach when I'm supposed to be in church. Yeah, okay. <laughs> There's a time for everything. I understand it's all as God leads you, but it's easy to do. Well, the only reason I pointed it out specifically was, remember you said these are the nations that will attack Israel. Yeah. And 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 was it Sudan, I think you, you said? Of course, they have a piece of accord that they just signed with Israel uh, like a few years ago. Right. And so now here's Turkey, another one of those nations that were on the list of coming to destroy Israel. So it's kind of interesting that those accords are written now. <laughs> and, you know, as, as we know that that will be the last, you know, one of the big attacks on Israel. Mm -hmm. And yet they've signed, quote unquote, the peace accords, you know, however long. I didn't I didn't see whether this was seven years. I just saw that uh -huh. ticker tape running at the bottom of the screen saying that Trump succeeded in getting them to sign this peace accord. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. more, more power to him. I, it's like, <clears throat> you can try all you want. Um, you know, money is a big, big bargaining tool. And I, I mean, I don't mind, obviously if I have two countries practicing capitalism and they're both getting wealthy, they're less likely to kill each other. You don't see capitalistic countries going to war with each other. But that's not the solution to world peace. It makes things um, more palatable for a while. So I mean, I'm I'm all for, you know, peace and prosperity and all that. But at some point, if it doesn't come from God, a house not if God doesn't build the house, it's not it's going to fall. Really, yeah. a question for you, John. Yeah. Is doing the right thing at the wrong time really the right thing? No, no, obviously. Yeah, I was thinking of Dallas Loudon's example years ago about this fellow that felt he was being persecuted because his boss caught him reading his Bible down in the down the aisle of the store he's supposed to be working. Yeah, he says, "Well, I didn't get a chance to do my my, my Bible reading this morning." Well, he was stealing from his yeah. boss. <laughs> yeah, it's it never is. It's it's yeah. Listen, let me ask a question now. I I must be wrong, but I feel that I have studied that in the first years of the tribulation, Pete, there will be a false peace. Yeah. The Antichrist will get all the countries being friends with each other. Absolutely. But remember, the peace that the world gives is the peace of fear. 
And the piece of surrender. So this is not that piece. Well, this, this would be, it, it, it'll peace. He'll, he'll succeed in having peace. Be three and a half years, he's going to unite the world. But you know, the world's peace is one of tolerance. The world's peace, I say surrender because that's one way to end a war. Mm. If you're in a war, well, I can end the war real quick by raising the white flag. Oh, good. Now we have peace. Yeah, but you're also oppressed. So but this is imagine, something we haven't seen for years. It's, it will be so much worse. Imagine a global peace where the entire every person is terrified to say a word. They're terrified to speak out. They're totally Crazy. oppressed, economically oppressed. Um, you don't dare say anything against dear leader. Mm -hmm. This has successfully happened in small little countries here and there. You know, North, North Korea. Korea. Is probably a, the perfect, beautiful example right now. You have some of the um, Saudi king, like, like Saudi Arabia. You know, that's a country which is 100% oppressed, but within within the borders they have peace. But you just the, the peace that the world gives is not what you and I call peace. I mean, I call peace being freedom to pursue, um, you know, what God calls me to do. And. I guess during the COVID months, we've had peace. <laughs> but have we had freedom? No. Um, is there a place for that? I mean, I'm not going to say it's all totally wrong. There's reasons to be cautious. We don't want to you know, tempt God by just ignoring things. But at some point, um, the church has to make some decisions. You know, we'll obey God rather than man. Well, Keep the church is. open. Shut down the bars. Okay. <laughs> what was that church in Colorado where the, the pastor recategorized his church at the strip bar so they could stay open? <laughs> By any means possible. <laughs> yeah. But at some point, you know, yes, churches have done what they've been told to do, but we have to realize <laughs> that we are obeying because God has told us to obey, not because they have any legitimate authority. The church does not submit to the state. And at some mm. point, the church is going to may have to make a choice. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to be open. We're going to be yes. open. We'll be wise. We'll have masks if you want us to have masks. But mm -hmm. can you start saying we can't meet at all? Mm -hmm. we got to exactly. make a choice. Mm -hmm. And fortunately in Maryland, that has not happened. But other states have had to make that choice. And I'm very mm. glad to see some churches that just, yeah, okay, they just caved. And if you're in a cave, maybe you shouldn't be open anyway. <laughs> Well, we've seen that right here in Bonners Ferry, where they say they can't tell the churches that they can't meet, but they're telling us what should be done. And some churches have chosen to just go online. Others have chosen to uh, meet, as you say, with masks and so on. But see, at that point, that, that's freedom. Here's your guidelines. You do what is what your conscience does you. And I have no problem with some pastors choosing path one, path two, and path three. There's different levels, however God leads. I have a very dear friend who's a, a, a good-sized church, and um, <clears throat> he has a much more elderly congregation. And he spent about five or six months having everything online, and he promoted it. <laughs> His church attendance online was triple the regular church. Income came in good. And a lot of churches started reopening again, and he did not. And he said the majority of the people wouldn't come anyway because they're elderly. They're a little more concerned. So he was led to do it that way. He still met. He had options there. He did some outdoor services. Now he has a combination of both. But he didn't do it at the same time frame other churches did. So, I mean, that's entirely with the prerogative of the church and the administration, how they want to do it. But to simply say, okay, we're just locking the doors. I mean, we have way too many people that have joined our church because their church closed. Mm -hmm. Not complaining, but it's, <laughs> it's shame. Uh -huh. just, it's like, you know, what, what our pastor gave the story of the Hebrew midwives who were ordered by Pharaoh to kill the babies. Mm -hmm. And they said, but they feared God. So they, they civil disobedience. There is a legitimate place for it. As Christians, if we're called to do it, or if you individually are led to do it, you do it peaceably, and you do it with full submission to the consequences. Well, so, well, okay, if you have to beat us and throw us in prison, you do, it, you do your job, we're going to do our job. 
Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not revolutionaries. We don't rise up. Um, obviously, there's a place in American history for peaceful protests, and we all understand people of faith took part in that with godly results. But when they're done in an ungodly manner, mm. there can never be anything positive come from it. So John, I had a question. You had, you made the comment about the atheist group. The motto is like, without God, isn't that like acknowledging God then for them? Yeah, it's funny in a way, yeah, good without God. Um, I know what you're saying and that's true, but on an even deeper level, how can you define, define good without God? True. You can't define it. That, I always I laugh at them and say, oh, use the word good. How do you, why are you using that word? That's one of our words. <laughs> get, get your own word. Because good, if there is an absolute right and wrong, good and bad, good and evil, if there's, if there's an absolute objective thing that exists outside of humanity, it has to be bigger than humanity. You know, otherwise humanity defines good. And hopefully those atheists who aren't thinking it through will realize what happens when atheist regimes have defined good. It has not been good. <laughs> right. well, the, freedom, the Freedom From Religion Foundation is becoming very active again just recently, I heard. Yeah. They, they think that that term is cute because they think they're they're doing a little pun on the word of freedom yeah. of religion and there have been countries that remember the the old soviet union in the constitution it was freedom from religion but when they gave the translated version to america they said freedom of religion oh yeah <clears throat> yes interesting times indeed and i think i think it's Go ahead, Mom. I think it's so interesting how many people are writing at the end of their little notes for on Christmas cards. God is in control. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's good, yeah. That's right. The year of our uh, Lord. I guess I failed. I can write that. <laughs> well, maybe it goes without saying. I, I didn't understand you at all. I was, I, I, was I was telling Edith that maybe in her case it goes without saying. It's just so, so much a part of her. So, so Judy, any thoughts? You're just smiling there sweetly. Just thinking about the separation of church and state and how they can be dictatorial with the churches if they want to separate. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not thinking right, but it's just something. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, first of all, in our Constitution, there is no such thing. Because at the time, the church was considered separate and part of the culture. And the idea that church could not be involved in the state would have been nonsense. Because the church was part of the culture. It was more of a Calvinistic worldview, but it was still there. Jefferson talked about that. And the Jeffersonian view is the one that we hold to because it's called that. And that is the church is not subject to the state, but the church voluntarily subjects itself to the state. Because prior to that, the church was the state. You go back to the, the Catholic church and the, the, the papal system. The church and state was synonymous and that's never supposed to be any more than the king and the priest are supposed to be the same person. That's completely wrong. It's just not, it, it's, it's unprofitable. It just can't work. When the church and state become one, that's like Islam. You know, you have religion and politics in the same bandway. So that's a legitimate concern. And nobody in the early country would have ever wanted to revert back to the state, having a state religion, which is why we have freedom of religion. But even in that case, in the Constitution, they were trying to say that the state religion, Maryland had a state religion of Catholicism. Virginia had a state religion of Baptist. And what they were saying is that in this confederation of United States, no one state has the right to de determine what another state's denomination is. And that goes back to the 30-year war 
when Catholics and Protestants were killing each other because the king of a country established the religion for that state. And if a, that king got taken over another king, people woke up and found out the next day they were Protestants instead of Catholics because the king was. But then all of a sudden, instead of the king, it turned out to be the governor of a region and then the mayor of a city. So the mayor of the city said, well, I'm a Catholic, therefore the city is Catholic, but the state was Protestant, but the country was Catholic, and then got bad, worse and worse. And the 30-year war, just everybody would have been dead eventually until they finally came up with this crazy idea that you could have more than one church in a town. And you didn't have to kill someone just because they were a different denomination. So as ugly as that is, that was able to spread into America, the idea that we can, because we believe in human beings made in the image of God and having free will, I don't have to kill you because I disagree with you. But that is uniquely a biblical worldview, and you're not going to see that in a non-Christian culture. And you do not see that in aspects of our culture that are becoming non-Christian. If I if you just if you disagree with me, I have to get rid of you by any means necessary. I have to shut you down, destroy your business, destroy your family. It's amazing how vengeance works when it's <laughs> when it's used by the world. I was teaching this in my kids, talking about justice. Let's say a, a cop kills somebody, and it's totally unjustified. What is justice? Justice means that cop dies. I'm not saying endorsing it, but that would be the definition of justice, right? What's vengeance? Kill all the cops? Discredit the entire um, industry? Discredit the mm -hmm. entire, you know, vengeance is going after the bigger. You know, one individual person said, I don't agree with gay marriage. Well, if you want to get even with him, do so. Don't hurt his family. Don't destroy his business. Disagree mm -hmm. with him. Have a good debate. But this... People taking vengeance into their own hands is a multifaceted thing in America today because they, if I don't believe that God's going to provide ultimate justice someday, I got to take it upon myself to do my part. I got to help them out. The biggest problem with vengeance is that it escalates and you get back to someone else and then they get back to you yeah. even worse than you got up yeah. I mean, you see it in all the old, old <laughs> Kung Fu movies. You kill my brother, I must destroy your family. Well, mm -hmm. no one survives that. But that's why oh, vengeance happy. belongs to God and God only. God what has the right the to do it. What about the Hatfield McCoy feud, supposedly? Yeah. Went on and on and on and on. So they forgot yeah. why they were feuding. Well, there's, there's a Hallmark movie out, The Spruces and the Pines. Yes, I was thinking about that. I love that movie. Yeah, a family feud from eons now like the grandkid had no clue what it was mm -hmm. all about right. yeah. The exactly. grandkid falls in love. and yeah it's a good movie she falls in love with the enemy yes I mean, the enemy, <laughs> the enemy yes. nephew or the enemy grandson right. it's a good right. movie sounds like Romeo and Juliet to me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh one last thing gay you mentioned some honic uh, um hanukkah music did you yeah. get some back did you want to yeah, share? Yeah, I, I got about five minutes of it. It was good. Uh -huh. oh. Did you want to share anything about that with us? No, but I have a funny question to ask you. I have a young man I met on the street. I so got a funny answer. Out. No, no, no. It's it's just it's Jewish people doing song and dance, and it's kind of nauseating to me to tell you the truth. It's just so without God, it breaks my little heart. Yeah, it's just sad. <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. You met someone on the street. I'm working with, I went over to give this young man some money he hadn't eaten for a couple of days. And he said he stood in the middle of a parking lot yelling at God. I've really talked to him about God quite a bit. And he says, God just won't reveal himself to him. What do you tell people that say that? We'll say, here I am. <laughs> Here's some money. God answered prayer. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm not. You say, I'm not God, but that's what I, say. I don't know God will answer you in the way and the time he wants to. I, and I laid hands on him and prayed for him again tonight. That's all I know to do. That's, that's absolutely true. But sometimes we got to, you know, as God leads you, of course, but sometimes to be able to speak with confidence and say, God sent me to talk to you. Yeah, I have said that to him. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Said, Why do you think you, made, you would have met me in the first place? He, he actually came to a church on Sunday, but he said, I couldn't wait to get out. I said, of course, Satan's trying to keep you from God yeah. with mm -hmm. all he's got. Mm -hmm. But he came. That's good. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And remember, God's watering the seed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's that's something that the an interesting thing though is the less he fights you, the more he will be fighting God, which is a good thing. Mm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we just give grace, we just give love, we we answer questions. Um, if if we get too, um, I mean, confrontation is not a bad thing. But if we get too embattled, mm -hmm. we start arguing. That gives that person a, a a target or a place to point to and say, "That's where my fight is." Right. But when they realize that you're not fighting them. Mm -hmm. But they still feel, feel like they're fighting somebody. Eventually, they realize it's God they're fighting. And that's always a good thing. Because when you fight God, when you're angry at God, when you're really mad at God, guess what? You're acknowledging him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what <laughs> so, I figured. At least he's talking to him now. It was more than before he met me. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Oh, that's, that's great. And too many times, we don't see the harvest. Like John said, if you planted the seed, someone else will water we may not see that harvest ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since he's on your heart, I would just be totally confident that you're going to see him in heaven someday. And and next time you see him, treat him that way, as you always have. It's just, it's it's a win-win. I hope you don't mind my asking, but it's like, it left me troubled tonight. I just came home at about quarter to seven, and it, and it just feels kind of useless, you know? Yeah, that, that's perfectly understandable. And we all get those, like, the backs of what ifs and mm -hmm. how this is going, but you know, that, don't let anybody steal your joy. That's You're right. Good. I'm that's experiencing that's the same thing to... with, with my barber. She's quite often you telling have a barber? me. Yeah, she's quite often telling me how. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I've had my hair cut recently. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> no. Anyway, she keeps telling me that she admires my faith and this and that, and I keep telling her she can have that faith herself uh -huh. and so on mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. uh, so just basically pray on that behalf that i can that, that somehow it, it'll finally bear from bear fruit but yeah. there there is a seed there she knows where i stand and mm -hmm. she's sympathetic to it sometimes that inoculation is not good mm -hmm. you be inoculated to yeah. do it too but yeah yeah I, I wouldn't worry about inoculation in that case mm -hmm. I, I know what you mean it can happen but well, that's that's how we have to work with our daughter Emily too. Just keep loving her, and we can't ever get in a debate or even a discussion with her no. because then it gets out of hand. But we just have to keep loving her, and you know, just keeping holding God's promises that she will come back to Him. Yeah, yeah, arguing. The worst thing that happened when you argue with someone like that is actually win the argument. That's the worst thing because now you've made an enemy. <laughs> yeah. And, and now she has all the more reason to resent you, and that can be inoculating. So yeah, you're uh, right. A, a comment, Edith, on that. A year ago, when we when we came back by way of Fort Collins, she took us out to supper, and sure. she invited me to pray for the meal in spite of everything, you know. So yeah. I thought, you know. And that previous year had been a rough year for them because both her and Matt had been in pretty severe car accidents. And mm -hmm. we could see for a while, there was that flicker of she was grateful to God too. But that flicker didn't last very long, but <laughs> we could tell it was still there. Yeah. So. Well, I got very excited this week. My twin sister told me that she has never given me for telling her 45 years ago that if she didn't receive the Lord, she was going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I think it's wonderful you still remember that. That's funny. I know I was crazy when I was first saved. I mean, if I thought I wouldn't have said it, but it was very true to me. As, as no, absolutely. Saved. Yeah. And we always remember that it's not God that's sending you there. It's God that's trying to keep you from going there. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. It's God that has provided a plan to, to rescue you to, so you don't have to. Otherwise, we'd all be going there. Yep. Yep. Mm. Yes, Jesus paid the price, so we didn't have to. Mm -mm. Yep. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. 
Mm -mm -mm. Great, dog. Can I have that song stuck in my head? It's a good <laughs> song that stuck in your head. Please, Pedro. Um, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Yep. There you go. Yeah, well, on that note, hey, Dad, you want to say a quick prayer and then we'll leave? Heavenly Father, it's been good to be in the study again and to be joyful that you, we know the end of the book and we know that. You are victorious on our behalf. Mm. And we know that it saddens you for those who reject you. You have paid the price for them, but they do not want to receive it. So help us to be willing servants to witness for you, to share, and realize that we don't have to be attorneys for you, but just, uh, just witnesses. <laughs> Bless each one that's here and help us as we go along our, our life as we continue our life uh, living for you and bless each one here in my precious name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless all of you. Good to see you there, Joanne. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. See you, Melinda. God bless everybody. Okay. Take care as well. Bye. Bye guys. Good night. See you next week. God bless you. Okay. See you Bye. again. Bye. Thanks Bye. so much, Pastor John. Good night, John boy. Good night, John. <laughs> I couldn't resist well, it. <laughs> okay.